Well, church, go ahead and join me in finding the gospel according to Mark, chapter 10. The gospel according to Mark, chapter 10. <clears throat> I want to read to you Mark 10, verses 17 through 31. Hear now the words of the one true and living God. And as he, Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go. So all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. And Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible. But not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands with persecutions, and the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is God's holy word. Let's pray. Ask the Lord to bless the preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, please help us. Help us to hear the teaching of your son, Jesus Christ. May we hear with faith and understanding and humbled hearts and love for Jesus. Cause us to learn, to realize that you are good and we are not, that we need you. Lord, your law points out that we are sinful and needy. Your law also doesn't just point out our sin and need, but it points us to Christ who is sinless and our need fulfiller. But Lord, open our eyes. Open our eyes to the impossibility of saving ourselves, even the impossibility of changing our own hearts apart from your grace. Please bring the unbelieving, those who are indifferent toward Jesus, or maybe even <clears throat> hardened in heart toward Jesus, bring them to repent, Lord. Bring them to follow Jesus. Save them. Would you please mature your church and Christ this morning as well? We ask all these things in the name of our Redeemer and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it's been a little bit since we were in Mark, and uh, kind of I was kind of in an awkward position because if you can remember, when it was Mother's Day, John decided to preach in Philippians where it was talking about circumcision, and it was just a fabulous, very fitting. <laughs> Mother's Day sermon. So I kind of felt, I was, gonna, I was planning on doing a Father's Day sermon, but I felt guilty that, like, you know, the moms 
you know, got a text about circumcision. So I just decided, we'll just keep preaching and Mark, and uh, not only is Mark good for dads, it's good for everyone. So let's just do that. So the last time we were in Mark, we actually covered those first verses that I read to you. Verses 17 through 22. Verses 17 through 22, that's the first part of this dialogue. In fact, that was our word to remember, dialogue. Dialogue was our sum-up word that happens, you know, explains or summarizes what takes place in verses 17 through 22 and following. So, in verse 17, this dialogue begins with an urgent approach and a very upfront question. This man, who is later on described as rich, runs up to Jesus, throws himself at Jesus' feet, and then he asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then in verses 18 and 19, Jesus answers with a very, very challenging response. First, Jesus questioned the man about his use of goodness, his standard and idea of goodness. Quickly following that, Jesus then states in very, very plain and easy-to-understand terms that only God, only God is good. He just says it like it is, that God is the standard of goodness because he is goodness. No one else is like God. So therefore, if God is good, he is the standard of goodness, and no one else is good like God. So after making very clear the right and proper standard of goodness and who is good, Jesus then lists off the last six commandments of the Ten Commandments. So in other words, he brings up God's commandments, and he's doing this because Jesus wants to give this young rich ruler who's approached him, who is supposedly seeking eternal life or figuring out what he must perform to get it, Jesus wants to give him a moral yardstick. Here's a moral yardstick to kind of measure your goodness, to measure yourself, to measure your performance, to see whether or not you're good enough, if you're good enough to inherit eternal life. Now, after Jesus brings up those those six of the Ten Commandments, in verse 20, this rich, young ruler responds to Jesus with a very self-assured affirmation. He said, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. He's not getting it. He doesn't understand what he was just, you know, handed over, right? Jesus gave him a moral yardstick, and he says, Yeah, I measure up. He doesn't follow. He doesn't get it. This young man believes that he is good enough, even though Jesus has already said at the beginning of the conversation that no one is good except one, that is God. Nevertheless, this man isn't buying it. He is confident that he is good, that his works are good enough to inherit eternal life. And so how does Jesus, where does he go from here? Where does Jesus go from here? How does he respond to this man's self-assured affirmation. Well, in verse 21, Jesus then delivers some heart-revealing requirements. Some heart-revealing, heart-exposing requirements. The man thinks he is good. He thinks he's good enough to inherit God's kingdom and eternal life with God. And so Jesus, to put it in a paraphrase, says, prove it. Prove it. You think you've kept all the commandments? You think that you have perfect faith and love and obedience to God? Prove it. Jesus is, in essence, saying, if you actually love the Lord with perfect obedience, then you should have no problem obeying him now, right now, as he commands you to give away all your earthly treasures. If you truly trust the Lord, then now is the perfect opportunity to prove it by trusting that The Lord will, in fact, give you eternal treasures that far surpass your earthly treasures. So give them all away, repent, and follow me. That's what's meant by Jesus saying 
him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Jesus always demands that those who come to him, those who seek him, must put away their idols, their man-made gods. They are gods that don't really exist. We just think of them as gods. And Jesus says, put those away. Whether it's an idol of right, possessions, positions, power, a person, a being besides God, or a passion, put those idols away and come to me. Repent of those things, forsake them, lay them aside, and come to me. So basically, what Jesus says to the rich young ruler is really no different than what Jesus said in Mark 8.34. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So he called this man to repent and to believe. To repent and believe the gospel. To repent and believe in Jesus. To lay aside his faith in himself. To stop depending on his own resources, his own so-called goodness. And instead, trust in Jesus. Depend on Jesus' resources. Jesus' real goodness. Lay aside those earthly treasures. Come, right? Lay aside those earthly treasures that you can get for yourself in this life. Lay those aside and come. I have treasures that no one but me can give you. Repent and believe. I can provide. And sadly, this is where part one of this dialogue fades out. Because in verse 22... This man who just approached Jesus pretty enthusiastically seeking eternal life becomes very dejected, and he simply departs. He walks away from Jesus with a very sad, sad demeanor. So think of it. Jesus just extended to him, just offered him a great offering. Have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. But this man simply refused. He refused because he loved his earthly possessions far too much. It was as if he didn't even hear Jesus make that promise. It was as if his, his ears were deaf to the promise that Jesus said, come, have treasures in heaven. It's like he didn't hear that at all. All he heard was Jesus say, I demand that you lay aside your earthly treasures. And he departed. He idolized, he worshiped, he loved supremely as most valuable his great earthly material possessions, and it blinded him to the good news. It caused him to be deaf to the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he walked away. So that's part one of the dialogue, which comes to an end. But then part two of the dialogue begins. And it begins in verse 23. What I want to point out from this kind of the, the outset is in verse 23 to verse 26, the very first part of verse 26, we're given this, these, uh, this series of sobering pronouncements from Jesus. We're given these sobering pronouncements from Jesus that are followed by shocked responses from his disciples. So just look at verse 23. Look at Jesus' sobering pronouncement. Verse 23 says, And Jesus looked around at his disciples how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. So now that the rich ruler has walked away, he's gone, Jesus turns his attention to his disciples and he simply announces the difficulty for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom. Even this man's sad rejection was graciously used by our Lord to teach his disciples a lesson that I don't think they saw coming. So he even uses this man's unbelief and unrepentance to teach his disciples about belief and repentance. 
to help them understand. Jesus is basically providing commentary. He wants to give commentary for his disciples so they can better understand what just happened. It is hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God to inherit eternal life. And what does that mean? Okay, what does Jesus mean when he says those words? Because we've heard people, right? I've heard people, you may have heard people, say some, you know, things that make us feel uncomfortable about those words. Well, the kind of rich people that Jesus has in mind are the kind just like the rich young ruler, the guy that just most recently walked away from Jesus because he idolized his riches. Yeah, those kind of rich people. In other words, it's a, gr- <laughs> this is, it's a grim and difficult thing for people just like that rich young ruler to enter the kingdom of heaven. People just like him find it incredibly hard to turn to Jesus and trust in Jesus for salvation. And then in verse 24, just listen to the disciples' shocked response. And the disciples were amazed at his words. Pretty simple, right? Jesus' sobering pronouncement shocked the disciples. His words caused confused amazement. They were bewildered. They were astonished. And then in verse 24, and as well, verse 25, Jesus then quickly delivers his second sobering pronouncement. And it's just a repeat, and then he adds on to it. So look what it says. But Jesus said to them again, again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It's as if to press his instruction, commentary closer to home, Jesus just repeats himself. He wants to become more emphatic. Oh, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. Now, one of the reasons why the 12 found this very surprising is because in that age, in that culture, there were a few misconceptions, common misconceptions, regarding the blessings of earthly riches, and they thought of them as divine signs of divine favor and salvation. Meaning, most Jews would find it inconceivable for material blessings to be a barrier to the kingdom of God. They found that that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Just listen to Proverbs 10.22. It does say, the blessing of the Lord makes rich. It says that. Now, there's nothing in that verse or the surrounding verses, right, entail that these blessings, these riches, must only be material. But either way, you can ask, aren't earthly riches, material possessions, aren't those from the Lord? Why, yes. And aren't they blessings? Yes, again. But let's not turn a blind eye to what the Old Testament taught regarding the danger of riches and those who exploit the poor. So the Old Testament scriptures clearly taught that mankind was sinful by nature and had a terrible tendency to turn God's good blessings into God-forsaking idols. Repeat that. The Old Testament scriptures plainly, clearly taught that all mankind was sinful by nature and had this gross, terrible, heinous tendency to turn God's good blessings into God-forsaking idols. Here's one example of this. You can find it in the book of Job. This is when Eliphaz, one of Job's friends, he mistakenly thought that Job idolized his wealth because Job was very wealthy. Eliphaz assumed that this was the reason, right? Job's suffering is severe because he idolized his wealth. So here's Job 22, verses 23 through 26. This is Eliphaz's counsel 
for those who trust in their riches. He says, if you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. If you remove injustice far from your tents, if you lay gold in the dust and gold of offer among the stones of the torrent bed, then the Almighty will be your gold and your precious silver. For then you will delight yourself in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. See what he says there? Gold is a blessing, but gold is not better than the blesser. Gold is a good gift, but not better than the good giver. So, even though the scriptures emphasize that man has a sinful bent to worship of wealth, still, nonetheless, the disciples of Christ were confused. It was probably unthinkable to them to think of wealth as uh, wealth or riches as an obstacle, a hurdle in the way to God's kingdom. So, not only did their misunderstanding lead to, right, their shock at Jesus' words, it even led to Jesus repeating himself. That's why he repeats himself, because he sees that they're shocked. So he just says, you heard me right, hear it again. And then he gives not just Right, repetition, he gives us this really fantastic analogy, right, to stress the difficulty, not just as difficult as an apparent, as a, a real impossibility. He says in verse 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier easier for that large animal to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, that's shocking, by the way. If you thought what Jesus said twice in repetition before was shocking, right, this was supposed to be unsettling, mind-bending. It doesn't make sense. How, how can something be more impossible than impossible? Right? Now, sadly, There have been some throughout church history and even in our modern day that have attempted to soften what Jesus says here. Some have famously claimed that there is this small gate leading into Jerusalem known as the needle's eye gate. So when Jesus speaks of a camel going through the eye of a needle, they would suggest that Jesus is actually referring to that gate in Jerusalem. And you see this camel, he's going to pass through the needle's eye gate, and this camel has to, right, Right, uh, unburden itself of its baggage and crawl upon its knees to get through. So in this case, according to them, Jesus is teaching that the rich can enter the kingdom of God. Just take off the luggage, take off the, right, unburden themselves of their love for riches and then humbly crawl on their knees to God. The only problem with that is that it's, that's crap. That is, her, or to quote Paul, that's scubula, okay, right? You should know that word by now, because John used it a lot during that sermon. And then, right? So I'm quoting Paul when I say that is, that is a crappy interpretation. That holds no water. There is no such thing as the needle's eye gate. There is absolutely zero evidence for such a claim. It was made up by an idiot in the 11th century, in the Byzantine Empire. And then, you know, we just run with it. But it doesn't exist. And, by the way, if we interpret Jesus' words that way, they fly right into the face of what he's about to say in a little bit. That this is actually an impossibility. Not just something that's difficult to do. This is impossible to do. In fact, it's like he's saying it's doubly impossible. So, judging by Jesus' own words, what he will soon say next, Jesus is truly teaching that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. It is easier for the impossible to happen than for a rich person, a person who worships their wealth, to enter the kingdom of God. That's what he means. What he says. (laughs) No rich person can enter the kingdom of God while trusting in their riches and venerating their riches as divine. No one can. 
And this brings out an even more shocked response from Jesus' disciples. Look at the beginning of verse 26. And they were exceedingly astonished. So you thought we were surprised before? We can't even explain how surprised we are now. Just when they felt as if Jesus couldn't surprise them any more than he has, he just goes, you know, out of, you know, the stadium. They can't track him. He is off the map. He's not registering. It doesn't make sense. He's, he's in a category that they didn't even imagine existed. He just said something that they couldn't bear hearing. That it's entirely impossible for a sinful man to take one step toward a holy God in his kingdom. To them, that sounded like, what? You said what? What about a camel and a needle? And that's easier? So, in this case, a rich person is referring to one who worships their riches. It's impossible for them to repent of that idolatry, turn to the one true and living God and Christ, and enter God's kingdom. It's simply impossible for them to do that by their own will and power. No matter how much freedom you give a sinner, they're not going to want to choose that. And it makes perfect sense, by the way. It, it's kind of shocking that they're so shocked. It's like, have you not read the Old Testament? Right? It makes perfect sense. Why would a sin-loving person ever want to come to a sin-hating God? Because then they don't get what they love, right? What would compel a sinner who most deeply loves his or her earthly possessions, all of a sudden to stop doing that and to start loving God as their most deeply prized possession or treasure? Well, nothing in that sinner. So Jesus clearly says that change like this, this kind of change, is not brought about by man. It is not brought about by man's sin-corrupted, idolatrous will. We do not obtain grace by freedom. As Augustine would say, we obtain freedom by grace. So this teaching is exceedingly surprising to the disciples, and it drove them to ask the obvious question, who can be saved then? Who can be saved? If it's impossible for that rich guy like that, who claims to have kept all of God's law from his youth, if it's impossible for people like that to receive eternal life, and enter the God's kingdom, who then can be saved? Did you not hear him, Jesus? He said he's kept all those commandments from his youth. Those kind of people? It's impossible for those kind of people? And my friends, this is exactly where Jesus wanted to take them. He wanted his disciples to realize how impossible it is for sinners to save themselves. He wanted them to feel the weight of this reality, that mankind is totally helpless, that mankind is unable to save themselves, himself or herself. So in other words, Jesus did this deliberately. He brought them to despair deliberately. He brought them to this kind of exceeding astonishment and bewilderment on purpose. Jesus deliberately wanted to bring his disciples to the humble realization that all humankind are totally helpless. They have nothing to appeal to in themselves for grounds of salvation. They have no hope in themselves, and all their hope is only in God's mercy. That's where he wanted to bring them. And my friends, this is exactly the kind of attitude that a sinner must have before he or she can enter the kingdom of heaven. This is exactly what they should think. I can't bring myself here. I must be brought here. I can't give myself a new heart. I'm like a leopard. I can't change my spots. If I'm accustomed to do evil, how can I not do it? I need the Lord to intervene, to do something. And as Martin Luther famously said, Despair is so very close to grace. And he knows that best, doesn't he? Despair is so very close to grace. So they were utterly bewildered, and they asked, who can be saved? 
And Jesus is happy to answer their question in verse 27. Jesus looked at them, so kind of like how he looked at the rich young ruler, looked at him, loving him, and he says, with man, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Jesus clearly said, with man, salvation is impossible. Right? That's the it. With man, it. What's the it? What did they just ask? Who then can be saved? Salvation is impossible for man to do. It's not seemingly impossible. It's not, you know, hypothetically impossible. It is impossible. It's impossible. So yes, Jesus, he's truly stressing that it is humanly impossible for wealth-worshipping people to receive eternal life in Christ through faith. Surprisingly, it would be easier for a camel, an adult camel, to pass through a small eye of a needle than for that to happen. And my friends, that is bad news for everyone who wants to work their way to heaven. Jesus just said, impossible. You can't do it. You won't do it. That's bad news for everyone who's depending on themselves to earn heaven. Jesus already said, before you begin the the race on the treadmill, you won't cross the finish line. You won't make it. But here's the good news. Yes, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Because... God is perfectly, eternally, unchangeably, holy, loving, and powerful because that's the case, because that's true of God, then all our hope is in God's mercy and in God's ability, not in our performance or in our ability. Amen? This is wonderful news. But you only see it as wonderful news when you see it from, when it's in front of the black, bleak backdrop of impossibility for human salvation. Right? Man, we're talking about man-made gods and man-made, man-accomplishing salvation. Jesus says, you won't, really under, you won't really understand or estimate or esteem what I'm saying properly unless you know how impossible it is for you to do what I do. That's wonderful news. Because our God is merciful. Our God loves to save those who come to realize that they can't save themselves, and they only realize that because he's already had mercy on them. That's awesome. May this realization move you to run to Christ and rely upon Jesus and him alone as your sufficient and only Savior. Now, the rest of this dialogue in this chapter, or not chapter, but in these passages, is between Peter and Jesus. So it goes from Jesus and the rich young ruler, Jesus and his disciples in general, and then Jesus with Peter. And Peter says something in verse 28. Look what Peter says. Peter began to say to him, to Jesus, See, look, behold, we have left everything and followed you. So in other words, what's Peter doing? Peter points out that he and the other disciples, as far as he knows, as far as he can see, haven't responded like the rich young ruler. They didn't walk away from Jesus. Even when Jesus said hard thanks to them, for some reason they didn't respond the way that that guy did. And Peter points it out. He's like, by the way, guys, have you noticed this? Peter's typically the guy that puts his foot in his mouth, right? Not here. Not here. This isn't proud. No. Right? The rich young ruler failed to repent and believe. Peter points out, oh, as far as he knows, see, guys, we left everything and followed Jesus. We did repent and believe, right? I left everything. I sacrificed all the so-called roadblocks that stand in the way between me and authentic faith, right? Somehow I put that aside, and I trusted in Jesus, and I followed him. And I think that's true of you guys as well. See what he's saying? It's not proud. Though he doesn't know the hearts of all the disciples, in his estimation, in Peter's estimation, the 12 seem to have responded with repentance and faith. 
They seem to have sacrificed all the so-called roadblocks and obstacles that can stand in the way of authentic faith. Peter takes this as evidence of God's mighty grace at work in them. And he should. I've seen the best for last. Verses 29 through 31, Jesus responds to Peter. And he responds with a promise and a proverb. A promise and a proverb comes first. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now and this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. That's his promise. Jesus guarantees that it is impossible for those who have repented, for those who have believed in Christ, to go unblessed by their Savior. It's impossible. Isn't that wonderful? It's impossible for you to dodge the blessings that your Savior has for you in this age and the age to come. Think of it this way. As impossible as it is for unrepentant, unbelieving rich persons, people who worship their wealth, as impossible as it is for them to repent and believe and enter the kingdom of God, it's just as it's equally impossible for those who do repent and believe to somehow miss out on God's abundant, generous, wonderful blessings in this age and the age to come. That's a promise. That's awesome, right? I mean, you usually think of this passage, you don't think of like, you don't think of this impossibility, you think of the first impossibility. It's impossible for man to save himself. I see it in the text. But for a long time, the goodness of this, of these verses just didn't dawn on me. Jesus is saying, that's true, Peter. Yeah, everyone that comes to me, everyone that comes to me, everyone that has sacrificed these things, unlike that rich young ruler, Everyone who's not that guy, I promise, I guarantee, I assure you that you will not miss out on what I have for my people. That's wonderful. That's a wonderful impossibility. Amen? Amen. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. My friends, indeed, Jesus can provide better treasures than what we can get for ourselves in this life. This is another way of saying, I was telling the truth to the rich young ruler. You lay, you lay down these earthly treasures, I have heavenly ones. Isn't it true? And then Jesus concludes his private teaching with a proverb. Verse 31, but many who are first will be last and the last first. This is a stumper for a lot of us. What does it mean? It means that no matter if you're the first citizen, the first one to become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, or the last person to become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, we all receive, all the saints receive an equal inheritance through Christ. All the saints are fully forgiven, fully justified, fully adopted, fully reconciled, fully sanctified, fully glorified in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? It doesn't matter if you're Johnny or if you're the first in line. You get the same thing in Christ. You get what he promises, a hundredfold in this life and a life to come. That's wonderful, guys. My friends, don't you know that you and I are wired to want these things? We want blessings, don't we? We want things that only Jesus can give us in fullest, full, fullest measure and forever. We all crave for pleasure and happiness and security and meaning and life. We desperately desire and long for these things. All these things we are hunting for. It's as if we've been programmed to hunt and search and yearn and seek these things. And sadly, because we're 
all sinful to the core. We don't believe God when God tells us that he and he alone can provide all these things that we so desperately want. He can provide this and more in himself. And we just think, no. Instead of trusting God and taking God at his word, we call his words into question. And then we hunt for all these things apart from God in the things that God has made. All the while persuaded that we can surely find what we're looking for by ourselves. We can surely find what we're looking for without God. We can surely find what we're looking for. Just give us enough time. We can find it. All the pleasure, all the purpose, all the security, all the meaning, all the life that we're looking for, we can find. We don't need you, God. In fact, you skimp us. We know you're holding back. It is terribly ironic that we forsake the one who is all of this and more. And then we settle for cheap knockoffs. For lousy substitutes that can only give us a joy that we will quickly and certainly regret. Why is it that heartache always follows sin? My friends, tell me if that Tell me if I'm describing you here. Have you ever come to realize that you're wrong and mistaken, that God was actually right the whole time, and that this very thing he told you not to go and try to get, you shouldn't go and get, and you finally go, I tried, and I, this is now, look at my track record. My whole life is just full of me trying to do things my way and get things that I want according to how I prize them. And God says no, and I feel as if he's a big meanie for not giving me what I want, and then I go and get what I want, and then it doesn't satisfy, it just disappoints. He's right again. And then a few moments later, we find ourselves in the same mess all over again. All over again. Strangely, we expect that disappointment won't follow our new attempt at the same sinful decision. Surely it's going to work out different this time. I'm so close to cracking the code. I'm so close to getting the formula right. The whole time, God is right. And we are wrong. My friends, we have to come to realize that what we long for, what we crave, can only be found in God and Him alone. We have to realize that God has been right all along. We've been proving His point all along, the whole time. Everything He says comes out true again, true again. My friends, are you sick and tired of the disappointing lies that you tell yourself? Are you, just, are you done with them? Are you, dumb, are you sick and tired of them? I hope that you are. I hope that you are. You cannot get for yourself what you've been looking for. And you know that. You know that. You have to come to Christ. Jesus offers us in himself something that is far greater than what we could ever find for ourselves in this age. So my friends, it comes down to this. Who is trustworthy? Who is able to save you? Who's trustworthy? Who's able to save you? Look at your track record. Are you trustworthy? Are you good at telling yourself things that are true, that are right, that actually play out like you think? Or is God the one that has the 100% track record? My friends, who is able to give you these things that your heart is nostalgic for? It just, it just bleeds for. I just want this. It's just imprinted upon my heart to want this. And I just know I want it. And that's about it. Who can give that to you? Who's trustworthy? Who's able can you do this for yourself, or is Christ the only one? My friends, let me put it another way for you. Does it make sense to trust Jesus for forgiveness and redemption, but not trust Jesus for joy and fulfillment? Does that make sense? He, he can forgive me. He's good at that. He's good at, you know, redeeming me, justifying me, adopting me. But when it comes to pleasing my aching heart. I just don't think he's trustworthy. What? You trust him for forgiveness, for deliverance from the wrath of God, but when it comes to pleasure, you think that he's going to skimp out on you? 
that he can't follow through, that he can't provide, he can't supply? Does that make sense? It doesn't. My friends, if you depend on Jesus to provide you with salvation from the wrath of God, if you depend on Jesus to give you eternal life with him, then why don't you depend on Jesus to provide you with pleasure and contentment in this age? To trust him, he's either trustworthy with all of it or trustworthy with none of it. You need to decide that. Jesus has spoken plainly about it. Take him serious. Unbeliever, don't you see what Jesus offered? That rich young ruler, his disciples, you see what he offered them? And didn't you hear Jesus' terms of receiving that offer? Repent and believe. Turn to Jesus. Trust in Jesus. And believer in Christ, has it become clear how you ought to respond to these same truths? The same Christ who brought you to faith who welcomed you into his kingdom is the same Christ who so patiently endures your sin and wanderings. He's also the same Christ who still beckons you to come to him for rest and fulfillment. The very king of kings who created you, who clothed himself in frail humanity, who bore your sin and punishment is the same king of kings who promises to provide for you and to preserve you. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Who will you run to for the desires of your heart? The options are before you. It's pretty limited. God or something he's created. Which one will actually provide? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for how wonderful it is to know the truth about who we are and who you are. How wonderful it is to know that <clears throat> you, you urge us to come. You welcome it. You offer. You offer riches that cost you but are free to us. You don't just offer forgiveness. You offer joy that is full, and pleasures that are forevermore at your right hand. You offer in Christ all that we seek. You know how many times we have thought that you were bluffing, thought that you were lying, thought that you were deceiving us, and then we wandered off. We found that what what we thought we were looking for, we took it for ourselves, and it disappointed, and it brought about that which is horrible and terrible. Lord, you know these things, and yet you call us to repent and believe. Yet you call us to yourself again. Lord, help us to respond. Help us to believe. Help us to take you at your word. Lord, we love you, and we thank you. Save the lost. Bring the lost to believe, and bring the believing to rejoice, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.